So we've been going through a new series called the Ten Commandments, and we're in week three now. So uh, first week, Pastor Ted was talking about the big picture, and then second week, do you remember what was the first commandment that Douglas was talking about? No other gods, right. So now we're going into week three now. Uh, we're talking about the second commandment, no graven images. And so I want to just pray before we begin. So would you just close your eyes and pray along with me? So God, thank you for this afternoon. Thank you, God, that we can come and uh, open our ears and open our hearts to your word. So uh, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and speak deeply uh, into our hearts today. I invite you to come and to just do a deep work inside each one of us. Thank you that you are a powerful God. There is no other God but you. And that there is no one that deserves more of our worship and our adoration and our affection, God, except you, Lord. So come and have the complete supremacy and the rule, God, in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So just to do a little bit of overview, uh, we're going through the Ten Commandments. And Pastor Ted was saying, like, the Ten Commandments are like one, actually. And uh, it's almost like a necklace, right? You can't just, like, separate one, because if you separate one, then everything falls apart. And um, in these laws that God is giving, it's almost an expression. This is what Douglas was saying. An expression of the lawgiver's heart and their character. So within each one of these commandments that God is giving, it's actually speaking about who God is. And so today, when we're going through this commandment, the second one, I, I want you to think about this question. And this is the question. What in my life am I making more important than God? What in my life am I making more important than God? So let's go to the verse. So we're going to be reading from Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6. So let's stand and uh, read this together. Okay. okay. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Great, you can have a seat. So this second commandment is saying that you shall not make for yourself an image, an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. To be honest, like when I was preparing for this sermon, I thought that this was part of the first commandment because the first commandment says that you shall have no other gods. And then you're reading this part and you like, well, isn't this part of the first commandment? Because it's saying you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything. So it's not basically saying no other gods? Kind of. So I was talking to Douglas, and Douglas was saying, sorry, I basically preached your message. <laughs> I said, that's okay, I'll find something else to talk about. <laughs> but there is actually a lot that we can talk about, specifically about image, okay? So the second, the second commandment is saying you shall not make an image, okay? What an image of anything in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. And when I first, when I was first reading this, I thought they were just saying there, you shall not make an image of God, but actually it's saying you shall not make an image of anything that is real. And so actually for the Israelites and for the Jewish, when, uh, for the Jews, when they were uh, observing this commandment, they basically subscribed to this idea of 
an iconism. So an iconism is the avoidance, prohibition, or opposition to the use of icons or visual images to depict living creatures or religious figures. The absence of material representations of the natural and supernatural world. So if you think about it, within our the Christian faith and the in the Christian church and history, we use a lot of imagery, right? Uh, we have pictures and symbols and stuff like that. Like you see pictures of Jesus and things like that. And uh, you also see it in other other uh, religions too. But for the Jews specifically, they actually don't have any visual representations of God. Like they don't even spell out the name of Jehovah, right? Or even the name of God. You, I, I don't, you know, sometimes, not sometimes, but when they spell God, it's, it's not G-O-D, it's G-D -D, or Jehovah. Actually, Jehovah is the same name as Yahweh. So sometimes when they're spelling Yahweh, it'll just be Y-H-W-H, -H, because God's name is holy. And so, anyway, so it's this idea that they're not making images of anything. And so you might be wondering, okay, so what's, what's the big deal? Like, why can't you just have a picture of something or have uh, some, uh, like, a, a a sculpture, an object of, of something. And the context was, it was idol worship that brought about Israel and Judah's downfall. And so when God is saying this, he's specifically saying that not only, not only can you have any like physical representations of who I am, but no physical representations of any other gods, so-called lowercase gods or, or deities. And so idolatry is what brought Israel down. So when we look at the idol worship in Israel's history, let me ask you this question. Do you remember what was the first idol that the Israelites made to worship? Yes, a cow or uh, a golden calf, right? So the context was the Israelites just got out of Egypt, and it's about three months in, and they, they get to the desert of Sinai. And they reach Mount Sinai, and God calls Moses, the leader of the Israelites, to ascend the mountain and go into Mount Sinai. And there God begins to give Moses instructions about how to lead the people of Israel. But Moses is there for a long time. He's there for 40 days and 40 nights. And after 40 days and 40 nights, then the Israelites begin to wonder, uh, where'd he go? Like, what happened to him? Is he still alive? And they said, where did our leader go? So basically they go to Aaron, Moses' brother, and they say to Aaron, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of, up out of Egypt, we don't know what hap has happened to him. So they say, make us a god, Aaron. And so do you know what, remember what Aaron does? So Aaron says, okay, give me all of your gold jewelry. And so this is what he does. Let's read this together, Exodus 32, 4. Handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Do you ever wonder why they made a golden calf? Why did they make a cow? Maybe the Israelites like beef. No, they can't eat beef. Anyway, bull worship or calf worship was a very common thing in other of the surrounding religions. So you figure, Israelites have just come out of Egypt. Do they know who God is? Not really, right? They've lived so many years in captivity, and all you know is that this guy Moses is leading you out. And so... Now Moses is gone. It's like, okay, who do we have to follow? So then they just look and say, well, here's what all the other surrounding nations and cultures do. This is who they worship. So they said, okay, well, why don't we just do the same thing? And actually, then the story goes on that Moses comes down the mountain, and he sees that they're worshiping this calf, and he actually destroys it and whatnot. 
All that to say is that God is saying, don't make an image of anything so that you will not worship them. Now, there were several other gods throughout Israel and Judah's history that they worshiped behind, besides Jehovah or Yahweh. And there, can you think of some, who were some of the gods that Israel and Judah worshiped? Can you think of one? Ashtoreth, right. Ashtoreth or Asherah, that's one. Molech, yes, Molech was another god. One that starts with a B, do you remember? Baal, right, ba Baal or Baal, I'll just say Baal, but I, I want to focus specifically on these two, Baal and Ashtoreth. So Baal, uh, actually the word Baal means Lord or Supreme God, and it was the Supreme God of Canaan and Phoenicia. And so if you look in multiple cultures, actually a lot of cultures will worship the sun, because the sun is the source of light, and the sun is the source of what gives us light, and then the light, you know, gives sunlight to the ground and growing the crops, and then you can grow the crops, and then you have things to eat. And so and you see, actually see in a lot of cultures that they look at the sun and they worship the sun, S-U-N. And so Baal was the sun god. And also Baal symbolized fertility or sex. And so actually when people worship Baal, Baal worship involved ritualistic temple prostitution. And so what, what the other cultures would do is like, okay, by worshiping Baal, you go to the temple and then you have relations with the temple prostitute. And I used to think, okay, what's the big deal? Why do they keep worshiping Baal? And then after I found this, I was like, okay, who wouldn't want to worship Baal, right? <laughs> so... Baal worship was very, you know, it had a very strong pull, and it was the source of downfall for Israel and Judah. Now, Ashtoreth, or Asherah, was the moon goddess. So there's the sun god and then the moon goddess. And it was the moon goddess of Syria, Phoenicia, and Canaan. And uh, how it was symbolized or embodies is that they would set up these things called Asherah poles, which are basically uh, sacred phallic pillars. And uh, what they would do is they take a tree and they cut off all the branches and then they would place it on the high places. So they put it on the hills or they put it on anywhere that is high and then they would worship uh, Asherah. And so in the same way, Asherah worship involved a lot of sensuality and temple prostitution. And so for the Israelites, when they see these gods of Baal and Asherah, they're like, wow, that sounds pretty good. And then they go into it, and there's, there's a draw to it because there's the sexual sin involved. And so idolatry actually is the same thing as sin. Well, idolatry is sin, right? But idolatry also leads us into sin and being in bondage by sin. So let's read this verse in Ezekiel 16, 17, which talks about worship of Asherah. You have also taken your beautiful jewelry from my gold and my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourself male images and played the harlot with them. Let's go to the next slide. Judges 2.13. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreths. Judges 10.6. Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So by, by the Israelites participating in Baal and Asherah worship, Israel was actually opening the door to not only sexual sin, but also giving all of the affection and the devotion. So God, it, God, Jehovah, is an exclusive God. God does not say, you can worship me and you can worship other things as well. When we become Christians and we follow Jesus, it's saying, I am only worshiping God. And so by the Israelites going and worshiping uh, all of these other idols, they're taking away their devotion from Jehovah, but they're also opening the door to be in bondage by sin. 
And so idolatry makes us enslaved to sin. So the idol of Baal and Asherah led to sexual sin, right? Because they're engaging in all of this sexual sin. And so by worshiping these idols, actually the sexual demons come in. And oftentimes it's in idolatry. It's where the enemy is hiding behind. And when we give our time and our attention and our devotion and our affection to these idols, actually what ends up happening is we open the door for the enemy to come into our lives. We open the door for the demonic to actually come into our lives. Do you remember the verse where it says, uh, do in your anger, do not sin and do not give the devil a foothold. So when you sin, let's say you sin once Sinning once is like opening the crack, like opening the door of your life one crack. But then when you do the same sin over again, it's like opening the door wider and wider and wider. And soon when you sin so many times, you actually open the door wide open and the enemy and Satan can come into our life. And then when Satan comes into our life, what does he do? Then he begins to make his home in our life. And so maybe Satan will start to make a little shack on your property. But the more and more you sin, the more you're giving the devil a foothold. And soon Satan is upgrading the shack to a mother-in-law house. And then upgrading the mother-in-law house to moving into your actual house. And by the, by the time you know it, you've sinned so much that Satan now just owns your whole life. Right? And that's kind of what it means when we're talking about strongholds in our life. Strongholds means that something has become, sin has become so strong in our life that we no longer control it, but it controls us. And so this is why idolatry is so dangerous, because by worshiping these things that we are supposed to be worshiping God, but we redirect it to something else, we're actually opening the door for Satan and the demonic to have control over our lives. So sometimes we are like, well, okay, that's, I mean, that was Baal and that was Asherah back then, but I don't see how that can affect us today. Actually, the, the demon that is hiding behind Baal and Asherah is the sexual demon. And so actually the sexual demon re-manifests itself in our culture, in our society, in a lot of different ways. Can you think of ways that hypersexuality appears in our everyday life? Holy? Oh, Hollywood. Yeah. Sometimes through a lot of media, through a lot of TV and movies, basically you watch TV, two things they're always talking about is what? Sex and violence, right? So it's the God of sex and then God of violence, lowercase. And, and so actually, what I didn't realize this until maybe about a couple years ago. And I didn't realize that by when we participate in sexual sin, we're actually worshiping the spirit of Baal and Asherah. When I look at the computer screen or my phone and I see something that I'm not supposed to see, yet I don't turn away, I'm actually devoting and worshiping that same exact spirit that the Israelites and Judah was worshiping. And so I invite all of the sexual demons to actually come into my life. And so sometimes we think that sin is not a big deal, but actually the dynamics of what is happening when you sin is you're actually opening the door for all of those things to come into our life. And so Baal and Asherah worship is still prevalent today. It's just that they're hiding behind different means. So you look in Israel's history about idol worship and they turn away from the Lord, but there are moments where some kings or people will actually go against this. And so let's read the next verse in 2 Kings 18. He, Hezekiah, removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image, and broke into the pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtim. So Hezekiah is one of the kings that tore down all of the Asherah poles and uh, removed Baal and things like that. 
And there are actually other people in the Bible that God asked them to destroy the altars of Baal. Can you think of another person in the Bible where God asked them to confront Baal? Yes. Do you remember the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal? So God, at that point, most of Israel were following Baal. There are more people in Israel following Baal than Jehovah. And, and, and it says that God said, I have reserved 7,000 in my name that have not bowed the knee to Baal. And I was just doing some guesstimation, but if there's only 7,000 out of Israel, Israel's whole population that is still worshiping exclusive, exclusively Jehovah, I don't know, that's like less than 1%, right? And so it's, it's just a crazy statistic to think about that most people were following Jehovah. And so God actually, you know, makes ask Elijah to challenge Jezebel and to challenge Ahab. And, sa- and they said, okay, we're going to set up two altars. We're going to set up one and build up stones, and then we're going to put bowl, a bowl on it, and then I'll do the same here. And you guys get to go first, and you call on the name of your God, and if Baal answers, then fire will come down and consume the offering. And if he doesn't, then that means Baal's not real. And then I'll do the same. So, and Elijah says, I'll call on my God, and if fire comes down and consumes the offering, then we will know that the Lord is God. And so what ends up happening is that the prophets of Baal are crying out for a long, long time, and they're even cutting themselves and whatnot, and nothing happens. And then Elijah prays, and then fire comes down and consumes not only the offering, but the whole thing, the whole altar. And so that's one example. Another example is Gideon. Do you remember the story of Gideon? Even before he leads the people into war, God asked Gideon to do something, right? He says to go and destroy your father's Baal altar. And Gideon is afraid, so he actually does it at night. But there are many righteous kings and prophets and people of God that tore down the altars of Baal and removed and burned the Asherah poles. Now, I want to ask or talk about what is an idol? How many of you come from families that worshipped other gods or other religions? What were some of the religions that your family worshipped? Ancestral worship, okay. Maybe for some of us, Buddhism. Uh, maybe for some of us, Islam, Hinduism, Confucianism, Taoist. Um, that, that's, an, that's an idol, right? That's a false god. I mean, that's just what we believe as Christians, that it's not real. So it can, an idol can, actually, can be like a literal false religious god, but also idols can be a lot more subtle. And I'll put it this way. An idol is anything in our lives that we make more important than God. So anything we give more affection, devotion, time, and worth to other than God. And that can be good things, and that can be bad things. But it's very much a heart issue. An idol, it starts with our hearts. Where am I placing my satisfaction? Where am I placing my love and my devotion? Where am I placing my hope and my joy? And if we're placing those things in something other than God himself, that becomes an idol. So idolatry is actually addiction. Idolatry and addiction, actually, it's two ways of describing the same thing. And so sometimes people are like, I'm not religious. I don't worship a God. But actually, the reality is, even if you don't believe in a God, you're still worshiping something, right? Maybe it's not in the form of a religious God, but you're worshiping something. You're giving your affection and your devotion and your meaning and your purpose to something. And so addiction... Addiction is going to a substance that will make you feel better. And that's oftentimes what happens with idolatry is that we keep returning 
back to the same thing and hoping that it will give us some form of a pleasure. Now, idols don't just have to be sinful in nature. It can be neutral or even good things. So idols can be a neutral thing made an ultimate thing. Or idols can be a good thing made an ultimate thing. So can you think of some even good things that could become idols in our life? Food, your phone, sports, children, family, relationships can become idols. Following celebrities, yeah. So there's a lot of even good things or neutral things that we can make even more important than God. Lastly, idols desensitize us. When I say de desensitize, it means it dulls our heart so that we're not receptive to God. I, my issue is consuming entertainment. And so the, my, my struggle is that sometimes I'll just watch way too much YouTube or Netflix. Maybe you can relate. But when I binge on YouTube, like the night before, and then in the morning I get up to open God's word, I find it really hard to read his word and pray. It's like I, I'm looking at the black letters, but it's not getting into my head. Or like I'm writing it down, but my mind just feels like mush. And I find that that happens a lot when I'm watching entertainment. And that's my struggle. And I, there's been seasons where I go back and forth because I said, well, is entertainment really an evil thing? Like there can be good stuff too, right? Like what if you watch a historical documentary and like it's very interesting and wholesome and whatnot. But I find for my sinful self, I'll compromise a lot, right? And it's like, well, you know, maybe it's not that bad. And then, and then it is bad and I'm like, oh no. And then, you know, inevitably what ha ends up happening is I have to either confess it in intercession or and I'll call up one of my friends and confess over the phone and have some accountability. But that's, a, that's an idol for me that I struggle with is entertainment and YouTube specifically. And um, I made a covenant with God maybe a year ago or two years ago. I said to God, I'm not going to watch rated R movies anymore. And I'm not going to watch it in general, but I'm especially not going to watch it by myself if I'm alone. Because I said to myself, like, I know that I'm so prone to stumble, and I know that it can be an issue. And, you know, I go, I go, I go in, in seasons or, or lengths of time. Sometimes I feel like oh, I'm watching too much YouTube again, and so... <laughs> I fasted for a week, so I said to God, okay, God, this week, and I'm going to fast it. So, you know, I, I'm on a fast again. So last Thursday, I said to God, all right, another week that I'm not going to watch YouTube, except for maybe <laughs> <laughs> sermons and worship music. I said, that's the only thing that I can watch on YouTube. Um, I'm just being real with you, and I'm, I'm just, I'm weak, all right? And, uh, you know, I, I was talking to a friend, and they said to me, you know, they were calling me out. They said, I can tell when you've been watching too much entertainment. You say, you, you talk more depressed, and you're not yourself, and, you know, you don't pray the same. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I said, maybe you shouldn't just watch YouTube at all. I was like, well, and then I was giving excuses. Like, you know, like, they're... Some things are not bad, right? Like, what are you saying? Like, we can't watch VeggieTales or, you know? And so, all that to say is, like, I don't know. I, I compromise, too, and maybe we all need to fast YouTube, all right? Um, so I was preparing for this sermon. It's like, oh, you cannot be a hypocrite. 
Like if you are telling people to give up their idols, you cannot not give up your idols too. So I said to the Lord, all right, I'm going to give an invitation to the congregation. And I said to myself, or I said, the commitment that I'm making today is I'm going to give up YouTube for the rest of the year. And if you want to join me in this quest, with the exception of worship music and sermons, if you want to join me in this quest, I'll give, like, I bought an, I have this extra Muji journal, and it's really nice. Like, I use this for time with Abba and whatnot, and I'm not bribing you, but I don't know. Whether it's human coercion or the Spirit of God speaks to you yourself, if you want to join me, I only have one. So if you want to join me this year, and it's only eight weeks, right? So give up YouTube, or maybe it's Netflix for you, or any other form of entertainment. I don't know what the older generation watches, but allow the Lord to convict you, all right? So after service, if you want to join me in my quest, now you can't just give it up and not do anything. You can't like give up YouTube and then just watch Netflix, all right? <laughs> I want you to spend time in God's word. So that's why I, I'll get, you want to see the journal? It's really nice. <laughs> Very high quality. It's lined and it has just the right amount of spacing. And uh, I don't know how many pages, I think 80 pages. But anyway, it was a focus on personal transformation. So we kind of led them through this thing called empowerment camp. And this is similar to what Eric and Lynn are talking about with PCS, but we led them to really confess their sins and really experience freedom and get free and, and inner healing and whatnot. And uh, one of the boys, uh, we were specifically, one of the sessions that day, we were talking about sexual sin. And so we were confessing our sexual sin and leading the youth that they can come to one of the older adults and just confess so that we can stand as a witness and then just bless them that, you know, Jesus forgives them and sets them free. And I remember one of the youth, he was, he, he really, he really received. And I don't think he had experienced the Holy Spirit before. Um, but at that moment, he said to me, he said, he said, I feel, I feel high. I, <laughs> And meaning like he felt like, whoa, like what's going on? And I don't know if he had like the right vocabulary to describe it, but I said to him, I think maybe that's the Holy Spirit, like, you know, like really lifting you out of all of the haze and, and whatnot. And um, uh, this youth, he had, a, he had addictions to a lot of things. He had, you know, a lot of cards and fantasy novels. He was particularly into magic and Yu-Gi-Oh and, and whatnot. And so after we came back from LSV and we came back to New York, he actually reached out to me and he said, can you, can you come to my house? And I said, yeah. And he's like, I want to just throw away some of these things that I, I feel like are standing, you know, in the way between me and God. So I said, sure. So I went over to his house and uh, we grabbed a trash bag and we went to throughout we went to his desk and uh, I said, okay, I opened the trash bag and I said, just start throwing things in that you want, you don't want to have in your life anymore. So he started throwing away all of these fantasy novels and Yu-Gi-Oh cards and toys and paraphernalia and whatnot. And we filled up one bag, you know, those big, you know, black gallon bags and it was all full. So we grabbed another one and we just kept filling it up. And finally we took it to the side of the house and, uh, then we dumped it <laughs> on the side of the house and into the trash can. And so I said to him, I said, this is what I want you to do. As you're dumping this into the trash can, I want you to confess to the Lord of how these things have become addictions in your life. And after you confess, then I'll you know, bless you and you can really be set free from it. So he did that. So we dumped it in the trash and afterwards I prayed for him and, you know, and then yeah, and then afterwards, I, I, I asked him, I said, just out of you know, curiosity, how much do you think those things were worth altogether? And he said, maybe eight or $900. And so close to $1,000 worth of you know, all of these different things that were not pleasing to the Lord. And so one thing that I'm just so amazed by that was that it wasn't guilt and it wasn't forced. I think he realized 
there was a point of realization where he realized God is so much better than all of these other things that I, it doesn't even compare to who God is. And so I think sometimes we can hear a story like that. It's like, oh, what a pity, you know, he was giving up all those nice things. But it wasn't. He was, he was getting free. You know what I mean? And I think for especially my generation, I think sometimes we think reality is so boring, and that's why we spend so much time in fantasy. And I don't know, I was thinking about that. It's like, well, if we're really living a Christian life and with Jesus, shouldn't life with Jesus be exciting? And, you know, shouldn't it be better than anything else that fantasy has to offer or anything else that material things or, or idols can offer? And that's where I want to go back to our original question is what in my life am I making more important than God? And idols can take the form of many things, but... Tonight, I just want us to spend some time and just like be really honest with ourselves and ask the Lord to reveal to you anything that you're making more important than God. And so Exodus is saying is that God is jealous for us. And when it's saying jealous, it means that God demands what is rightfully and uniquely his. And so you think that you're finding satisfaction in loving this thing or whatever it is, but I don't think we realize that actually what you really want is Jesus. Actually, what you really want is the filling of the Holy Spirit. Actually, what you really want is the love of Jesus because those things don't change and those things can satisfy even more than anything that this world has to offer. And so I'm going to give us some time tonight to really ask the Lord to reveal to us anything in our lives that are idols. And like what I was saying before, you know, idol worship can actually be other gods or religions. And in that specific verse in Exodus that we're reading, it says, God punishes the sins of those up to the third and fourth generation. So I don't know whether in your family line where your grandparents or your great grandparents used to worship other gods, and I don't know if you've ever gone through that to actually pray to cut off idol worship in your family bloodline. But maybe tonight that's something that you want to do is, you know, basically coming before the Lord and saying, God, I want to confess on behalf of my grandparents and my great grandparents or my just my ancestors of how we worship the God of whatever and we didn't worship you. So maybe that's something you want to do tonight. Or maybe like me, right, it's entertainment or social media, or video games. Maybe for some of us it's drugs, or alcohol, or substance abuse, or maybe it's more intangible, like work, or family, relationships, career, money, toys, things, possessions. But I'm going to give us some time today to really think about that. And so you can close your eyes. Maybe, Kelvin, you can just play some background um, music. But just take some time to listen to the Lord. And after we take that moment, I'm going to invite us to really stand and pray to really cut off those things. So let me pray for us. So Lord, we say that you deserve all of our life and that you deserve all of our worship. So I invite you, Holy Spirit, to come now and reveal to us if there's any things that we're making more important than you. So come Holy Spirit and reveal to us. So now you can take time to reflect. If you need to write notes, you can write it on a piece of paper or you can write it on your phone. But if God reveals different idols in your life, you can just take note of it. But let's take a moment to listen. Okay, so I'm going to invite us to stand. And whatever had popped into your mind or whatever Holy Spirit revealed to you, we're just going to lay that before the Lord. And if you don't know what to confess, you can confess anything on this slide, whether it's idol worship or any of the other things. But we can open our mouth and just 
confess before the Lord. Okay? So let's do that together. Okay? One, two, three. So God, I confess, God, of all idol worship, God, in my uh, bloodline, God, from my father's side and from my mother's side. God, I confess that we followed other gods, God, and we followed all of the ancestral worship, God. Lord, forgive us, God, that we place all of our hope, Lord, in, uh, in that, God, and even in the things that we think that we can achieve, God, by our own human hands and by our skill and by our talent, God. God, I want to confess before you, God, all of the idols, God, of entertainment, God, uh, social media, games, Lord, making these things more important than you, God, giving more attention and devotion and time uh, uh, to those things than you. Yeah, Lord, I confess, God, of all, yeah, uh, work, God, making work, family, uh, relationships more important than you, Lord. Forgive me, God, for being more concerned, Lord, about uh, uh, security, God, and money and, and putting my security, God, in, 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 in the things that I can achieve, Lord. I confess of all idolatry of money, God, even possessions and toys and buying things, Lord, online and uh, making this more important than you. So, Lord, I really lay before you, God, all of the idolatry, God, that is in my life. You can hold out your hand. So I bless you in Jesus' name for all of the things that we have confessed today, that the Lord hears our confession and the blood of Jesus covers you. And so now uh, I bless you that we can now renounce all of the idols that are in our life and that we don't have to be bound to it anymore. So the same things that God revealed to you or that you confess, you can now verbally just renounce it. So you can just say like, in Jesus' name, I cut out and then whatever it is, okay? So let's pray that all together, whatever God revealed to you. Yeah, so in Jesus' name, I cut out all of the ancestral worship in my bloodline from my father's side and my mother's side. And Lord, I say that I only worship you, God. I say, God, that uh, me and family, God, and even future family, that we will only serve the Lord and serve Jesus Christ. I cut out all idolatry, God, of entertainment, God, of uh, social media, God. And I, I, I want to give my total attention, Lord, to you. God, I lay down all of the idol work and uh, relationships, God, and career, God, possessions and things, materialism, Lord, and I want to lay it down today and renounce it, God, and say that I only want to uh, place my hope and my joy and my trust in Jesus Christ. And so, God, I commit myself to you today. So I bless you today in Jesus' name. I, I want to read you this verse from Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. And it says, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. And so I bless you that your life is for Jesus Christ. And it's not even for what the temp the draw of what the world offers. But I bless you that God has put on your life a holy calling and a holy purpose. I bless you that your eyes would always be fixed on Jesus Christ every single day and that you won't relegate yourself to just a normal Christian living, but that God would set your life on fire uh, as you put your life on the altar. I bless you that you would be in deep love with Jesus, that even maybe there are some seasons where you feel like, oh, my love for God or my passion for God is dwindling, but I just bless you with a fresh fire and a fresh passion and a fresh love for Jesus. That every day that when you wake up, that you say, I don't, those things, the other things don't even compare to the love of Jesus in the presence of the Holy Spirit. I bless you that you would be yeah, filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit every single day and that God would give you his word and his instruction and that every day that your reality would be better than any fantasy and that the purposes and the kingdom and the mission of God would consume your heart and it just be so exciting because that's how God has designed our lives. And so I bless you yeah, with that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. So the last thing I want to encourage you to do is to clean your house, okay? So some of you have seen Marie Kondo and 
I don't know if you still watch that, but I want you to do a spiritual cleansing of your house. So I want you to go home, and when you go home, you tear down the high places and the Asherah poles in your life, okay? So in the same way that I did with this youth, you can go home, you could take a trash bag, and you throw away anything that does not please the Lord. And so if you don't know if it pleases the Lord or not, you just pray and you ask the Lord, God, do you want me to have this? And if God says yes, okay, you can keep it. If God says no, then you throw it away, okay? You can delete apps. You can delete accounts. You can throw away video games, uh, fantasy or sorcery books, and cut soul ties with past lovers, all right? So if you still have their number, you can delete them, and you don't even have to say bye, okay? And uh, if, if, if an app is an addiction to you, you can delete it, all right? And the, the, the why of this is because Jesus is so much better. And we commit to pursue holiness and deep love for God. Okay? So I give you, I bless you with the courage today to be set free. Because I think that's what really what God wants to do is set you free. And so um, I got set free from uh, social media. So God can set you free too. Okay? So I bless you with that. All right? Have a great week. And hope that you can join us for dinner upstairs. And if you want to join me in my quest, you can uh, come up to me. All right? Thank you.